Oh, we know if we have audio. Great. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, October's IGHS Grand Rounds. Um, I am Payam Nahid. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health Sciences. I'm delighted to see you all here, and for those of you who are joining online, Today we have a very special grand grounds with CHASA, the Center for Health Equity and Surgery and Anesthesia, and um, a, uh, a sort of featuring of a very successful Global Health Equity Fellowship, which I understand is its third year, um, quite impactful, 25 fellows uh, per cohort, um, uh, with uh, uh, some success stories to be shared with you today. Um, I think this is exactly the kind of example of workforce uh, partnership and development that IGHS hopes to have, um, contributing to um, excellence in, in uh, surgery and anesthesia and, and health equity. So with that, um, please grab your lunches and um, I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Padmanabhan who's a, a Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and CHESA Co-Fellowship Director to uh, introduce the rest of the session. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much to Dr. Nahid for that uh, lovely introduction. And um, thank you to all of you for joining us today. We're very excited to uh, tell you a little bit more about Chesa, our fellows, um, our success stories, and our goals. So um, I'm here with several other people from our institution. Um, I'm, as Dr. Nahid mentioned, I'm an ophthalmologist here at UCSF and at SFGH. I co-direct a fellowship along with um, Dr. Leah Jacobson, who's on the line with us and will be speaking via Zoom. Um, Dr. Leah Jacobson is an assistant professor of otolaryngology um, and one of our co-fellowship directors. We have a third co-fellowship director who couldn't join us today, Kathy Kaliawala from um, Bulago National Referral Hospital in Uganda. And then in addition to the three of us, we have um, several other of our um, precious people from Chesa. We have uh, Dr. Martha Namuga who is a urologist and uh, faculty at Mercury University in Uganda, and also one of our former Chesa fellows and alum. Um, she is a course coordinator and lead instructor for the Kampala Advanced Trauma course, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Um, Carol Dr. Caroline Stevens, uh, who is one of our UCSF general surgery residents and also a Chesa fellowship alum, and is an advisor to that same trauma course um, here with us. And then finally, Dr. Treasure Ibing Vira, who is a general surgeon and faculty member at the Lifeline International Hospital in Zana Macquarie University, uh, also one of our fellow alum and a course coordinator and lead director for the Kampala Advanced Trauma course. Finally, we have our deputy director, Patty Orozco, with us, who you'll maybe hearing from later. Um, <laughs> um, Patty is the life and soul behind everything we do. And um, Dr. Drew Gaskadez, who's a pediatric surgeon here with us at UCSF and is the director of our, of our institution. So we're going to tell you a little bit about our, cello, our CHESA Fellowship, and then you'll hear from our fellows about uh, their collaborations to build an integrated trauma system to Uganda. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about CHESA first, um, and then Dr. Jacobson will do an overview of the fellowship, and then I'll leave it to our fellows to tell you more about their project. We'll leave some time at the end for questions. I don't think I have to lecture this particular audience about global health disparities. Um, sometimes I think we don't focus enough on surgical disparities, so a little bit of stats here. Over 5 billion people in the world have no access to safe, affordable surgical or anesthetic care. Um, 81 million people face catastrophic burdens simply to seek perioperative care outside of any other care that they may need. Surgical disease accounts for 30% of all morbidity and mortality worldwide and causes more annual deaths than HIV, tuberculosis and malaria combined, um, and 25% of maternal deaths can be prevented with increased access to emergency obstetrical care. And so the, the um, drive to address some of these issues was one of the um, motivations behind the formation of CHESA. In the United States, we don't fare much better. Uh, black men in their 20s have 20 times the firearm fatality rates as white, maternal mortality rate three to four times higher for black women versus white women, um, children, black children are three times more likely to die in the course of uncomplicated surgery. 
Um, rural populations have a lower cancer survival, and overall, we just have uh, really wide, varied, and inequitable access to um, proper anesthetic services. So, TRESA, as our mission, um, is to expand equitable access to perioperative care through partnerships that strengthen capacity and advance shared priorities, um, both globally and locally. And our vision is that we envision a future where the global and local capacity of surgical, anesthetic, and perioperative care serves everyone everywhere. Um, <clears throat> uh, we formed in 2020 as one of the core centers in the Institute for Global Health Sciences. This was a culmination of decades of global health experience across departments. Um, we have over 500 members from UCSF, uh, and we include 10 departments and division among our collaborating institutions. We have a very diverse leadership, uh, eight surgical subspecialties, including anesthesia and nursing, as well as many uh, partners across the world in low and middle income countries. And we largely build on the legacy of Dr. Haley DeVos. So many of our objectives uh, to bring together silos um, among those of us in global surgery, which can otherwise feel like a very isolated endeavor uh, to advocate for balanced implementation research. Um, to expand long-term partnerships and resource-denied communities, to create new models for academic collaboration uh, based on reciprocity, action, and equity, to develop pathways to generate future leaders in perioperative equity, and to be a flagship organization for investment in perioperative equity. And our fellowship, I would say, um, touches on each of these key objectives um, in one program. So the fellowship itself is a non-ACGME multimoded uh, fellowship program that has one of the largest global surgery fellowships in the US, if not the largest. Um, we collaborate with a number of other initiatives, including our, our home institution, including our open oximetry project right here at UCSF, the World Health Organization, um, the WHO Club, we're also a WHO collaborating center for emergency critical and, and uh, operative care. Um, as well as the Uganda National Surgical Obstetric <coughs> and Anesthesia Plan. So we have a number of partners and organizations that we collaborate with across the, across the world. Um, and then to talk a little bit more in detail about the activities of our fellowship, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, partner in crime and co-director, Leah Jacobson, who's on Zoom with us. Thanks so much, Shree. Can everybody hear me? Maybe a little louder. Okay. Um, I'll do my best here. Um, well, it's an honor to be here, and I'm uh, apologies that I couldn't be here in person. I'm going to talk briefly just a little bit about our fellowship structure um, and uh, what our fellowship has looked like over the last few years, and then pass it off to our alum to give their um, to give a, a firsthand account of their experience and the wonderful work that they've done with their project. Next slide. So as Shri mentioned, our fellowship um, is a, it's an 18 month program. Um, it's multidisciplinary across multiple fields of surgery and anesthesia. All perioperative health providers are, um, are able to join. And um, it's really geared towards those who are dedicated advancing health equity and perioperative care in their respective settings. Um, it's not accredited and it's um, multimodal and it's held mostly in a virtual platform. And the different components of our fellowship include uh, the, the fellowship long project. Everybody comes in with a, uh, with a specific project related to uh, perioperative health equity. Um, there's a robust mentorship structure uh, consisting of both UCSF mentors as well as, uh, as well as a opportunity to build mentorship throughout the fellowship year. There's a structured self-led global health equity curriculum that's largely focused in perioperative care as well as twice monthly fellowship meetings that happen on a virtual platform. Um, and those include um, expert lecture series, workshops on building various uh, research skills as well as career building skills. We have a, a, an annual retreat presently um, that, is, uh, that happens in Uganda uh, that allows us to come together as a community as well as, uh, as, well as opportunities to engage in person um, both at UCSF and at partner sites overseas. Um, and really our, our intention is to build a global community as Sri mentioned, um, some of the work that we all do can feel like you're working in a silo if you're the only surgeon in your respective field in a given country, for example. And so our goal is to create a community for people to, to really engage and, um, and build a support structure around this, uh, this important work. Um, 
And yeah, there's a lot of network building and long-term mentorship. So uh, just broadly our impact to date, we've had 80 fellows since the inception of the program, uh, about half have been female um, and 80 plus percent are in their early career, but we do have people spanning uh, different stages of their surgical career from residency and onward and their anesthesia careers. 71% um, have been from LMICs and there've been a total of 80, 181 publications by fellows and alum since 2022. 98% um, of our fellows are practicing uh, clinicians and are working in tandem while doing this fellowship, serving vulnerable populations worldwide, um, as well as teaching and mentoring uh, to undergrads, postgrads, subspecialists. So there's, there's really an exponential um, impact that all of our fellows have on their communities. Um, we've had 16 specialties listed here across various realms of surgery and anesthesia. Um, and next slide. And this is just a global map of where all of our uh, fellows have hailed from so far. So we are we are growing and expanding year by year. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been an incredible opportunity to interface with everybody involved with this endeavor. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to our amazing fellowship alums to talk about their work in uh, trauma care in Uganda. So my name is Caroline Stevens. Um, I'm a prior Chester Fellow. This is my name is Treasure Living Gear. And I'm Nam Gamatha Monica. And so we're going to talk about our work, which has really been a collaborative project um, uh, relating to development of trauma systems and LMICs. And we would be remiss if we did not also mention that this work builds on really decades of work that came before us and has been really an ongoing project that has been contributed to by multiple individuals. So to give a little bit of background as to why this is important and really relevant, especially for anyone interested in global health, we do know that injury is the leading cause of death worldwide. And approximately 90% of the burden of disease related to injury is in low and middle income countries. It causes an estimated 5 million deaths per year. And in addition to the deaths, what is also of course critically important is the morbidity from trauma. And approximately 1 billion people sustain injuries that require healthcare every year. When we think about the burden of disease, I think especially, you know, I have an MD and an MPH, so putting my MPH hat on, you know, I think a lot of what's talked about in the public health realm is the injury prevention side of injury. But there's also a critically important side for the care of the injured. And there's been huge strides made. And I think some of the work actually done in this country related to injury prevention is a great testament to the impact that injury prevention can have with helmets, seatbelt laws, putting in stoplights, putting in speed bumps, all of these things are really important to preventing injury. But it doesn't start and stop there. And I think really what the physicians have to add to this discussion and really what we're talking about here is the care of the injured and how there's a whole process of things that need to happen for that injured patient to ensure that they survive the injury and also to ensure that they're able to reintegrate into society. And so when you look at the data in low and middle income countries, about 38% of the deaths could be averted with improvements in the care of those who are injured. So kind of taking an even greater step back, uh, I think both of these concepts really get into what does it mean to build health systems for those who are injured? And really what that gets at is what is a trauma system? So a trauma system encompasses all components of care of the injured, as well as all of the components that go into the advocacy and primary prevention. And this, as you can see here, is kind of, you have an umbrella of your advocacy, injury prevention, legislation, all the things that we advocate for to improve at the kind of larger health system level, education and training of individuals, making sure that everyone understands how to care for those who are injured, doing research to improve outcomes, improve quality, and then for those who are on the ground taking care of patients, the other critical components are all of the phases of the injured process from the, when the patient is injured <coughs> to when they're able to reintegrate. And so this is why we think about pre-hospital care, emergency care, intraoperative care, in-hospital care, so in the ICU and in the hospital afterwards, and then rehabilitation. So our work has spanned many components of this trauma system, and that's really what we're gonna focus on today. Um, so we will talk a little bit about what we did for pre-hospital training to improve that side of things. The advanced trauma course, which really focuses on training frontline workers and critical skills for the 
um, management of patients when they first come into the emergency areas, an operative trauma course that we run, which focuses at the surgeon level for transferring skills to ensure that everyone understands how to manage injured patients, the development of a trauma fellowship, and then kind of our larger vision for all of this work, um, which is the establishment of the Trauma Surgical Foundation in Uganda. So I'll talk just briefly about the pre-hospital care side, and I think this is one of the first things that we started really to address a lot of the burden of disease that was seen in Uganda. One of the problems that we see as healthcare workers is when patients come in, you know, you're dealing with injuries, but you're often also we're dealing with injuries caused by the inappropriate management of patients from just transferring from the ground into a truck and getting them to the hospital. And so for those who may not be aware, for instance, like let's say you're on your bike and you're bike riding and you fall and hit your head and you potentially injure your spine, there is the concern about the injury that could happen to the spine, but if you're not moved in a careful and safe way, there's secondary injury that can occur, and actually that secondary injury is what could actually cause disability. So for instance, like a spinal cord injury. And so it was often observed that patients would be moved in a rough way, which would exacerbate injuries. And this is really what came out of this, was focusing on working with the police as well as bystanders, which were often voda voda drivers, which are frequent drivers um, that you see around in Uganda, who would be seeing the injured person and trying to assess them and get them to, into a place where they could receive care. And so this was started and primarily focused at the police force, and it focused on doing basic first aid. Um, so you can see them all practicing, for instance, splinting a patient here, and then creating a first aid kit that, that could be easily carried, um, really made from locally available resources and supplies. And I think this is one of these programs that the success of it was that the police were so enthusiastic that they wanted to take it on themselves. <laughs> so it's not a program that we're continuing right now, um, but I think it's a testament to how it, having collaborations locally is very important. And then moving to the kind of next phase of what we focused on was really this question of the initial care of the injured when they come to the healthcare center. And for those who may or may not be aware in the United States, the standard of care that we provide to any patient, really to any emergency department that you could come to is called the Advanced Trauma and Life Support or ATLS. It's a certification that anyone who works in an emergency setting must go through in the United States. And it's been shown and has great evidence since its inception to significantly improve the outcomes of those who are injured. It focuses primarily on addressing life-threatening disorders in a very standardized way. And, and you can kind of see this is like the assessment here. And the whole point of this assessment is to immediately intervene on the life-threatening injury that you see. But like many things in global health, you cannot simply take something that is done in a high-income country setting and apply it to a low-income country setting. And there are many challenges with applying this into other settings. For instance, it presumes availability of many supplies that frequently aren't available in low-income country settings. It presumes availability of blood and massive transfusion, which frequently is not easily accessible. Importantly, it presumes that you can get a chest x-ray that comes to you, and in many places that's not true. You bring the patient to where the x-ray is. And then it presumes access to many medications that aren't available, and it's essentially completely unaffordable. So it's a <coughs> course that is um, copyrighted by the American College of Surgeons. It costs about 790 per individual who completes the course. You know, for me, I'm lucky in that the hospital pays for me to complete the course in the United States. But of course, if you're talking about rolling this out in other settings, there needs to be an affordability consideration. Okay, hello, once again. So uh, continuing from uh, what Carolyn has been telling you, um, in view of all that has been mentioned, we developed what we call the Kampala Advanced Trauma Course. For those of you that don't know Kampala, Kampala is the capital city of Uganda. Uh, it's called Kampala because we rolled it out in the capital city, that's where the national referral is. And basically the aim for this was to provide evidence-based, contextually appropriate skills in trauma training. And the goal was to ensure that uh, all frontline doctors in Uganda understand how to care for the injured. That's in a surgical way. Um, although now it's no longer called Kampala because we are going to tell you why. So um, basically, what does this course do? It started in 2008, and it's taught by local faculty. The requirement for you to get into this course is um, completing medical school. It's about five years, and then you do one year of internship. So every intern goes through this course. It's conducted four times a year, and so far we've taught about 2,000 interns. And the cost of this training comes down to something like 30 um, dollars. 
So who are the local faculty? So just like you do here, we also have um, different departments. That's pediatric surgery, neurosurgery, anesthesia, orthopedic, plastics and burns, OBGY, meaning obstetrics and gynecology. So someone from these um, several departments comes and gives a talk and uh, that's a tutorial to these interns and then shows them um, uh, a simulation of uh, some of these. So some of the simulations um, are shown here. Airway from the anesthesia side and surgical intravenous access from um, the surgery side and uh, chest tube placement that's also from the cardiothoracic surgery <coughs> side. These are some of the very important surgical interventions that um, any person working in A&E should know. So <coughs> it's no longer called Kampala Advanced Trauma Course because we decided to expand it to the rural hospitals. Some of the hospitals are shown here. We have Mbara. Mbara is in the west. This is the map of Uganda. Oh, okay. I can, yeah. So Mbara is in the west, somewhere here, this star. And then you have Gulu. Gulu is in the north, up here. Then you have Kaolo. Kaolo is a little bit more of the central. Kampala is right next to Kaolo here, just above Lake Victoria. And then you have Moroto, which is in the northeast. And then you have Mbale. Mbale is in the east, neighboring Kenya. So we decided to push it out to some of these hospitals. And the first um, experience that we had, or the first trial that we had, we called it Train the Trainer. So you basically get some of the surgeons from these different hospitals, um, train them, give them this training, the Kampala Advanced Trauma Course, and uh, have them take it to their several hospitals and teach the, the people within. So um, the feedback from this was that they felt like they were islands of knowledge because trauma is a team, it's a team thing. So if you're the only one on your team that knows what you're supposed to do, then most of the times you feel isolated. So then we had some um, assessment into all of this and we found that there were significant delays in uh, trauma patient assessment. Some of the delays are indicated there, five minutes in obtaining the oxygen levels, 10 minutes before someone could listen to the chest, 12 minutes before someone could obtain um, the patient's blood pressures, and about 20 minutes to establish IV access. So what we decided to do was um, change the model of training and then we decided to go out in teams. We get a team of specialists and go to these different hospitals. But before we could do that, we decided to do evaluations. So these are some of the pre-evaluations that we decided to do. We would go out to the hospitals, engage uh, a surgeon, a local surgeon. We did some of these uh, pre-evaluations with Caroline, so she's been to Uganda extensively. So we'd assess the, the A&E staffing, would uh, look at the resources within the A&E, such as oxygen supplies, uh, diagnostics, um, yeah. And then we'd look at the types of trauma seen. Um, are you seeing um, stabbings? Are you seeing gunshots? Are you seeing um, border board, uh, sorry, motor vehicle accidents? <laughs> Yeah, so and then we also looked at the, the specialists, the subspecialities within these hospitals. So after doing the pre-evaluations, we then went out and did the trainings. So some of the pre-evaluations were done, for example, in uh, the hospitals that I showed you on the map. Those are some of the pictures. Uh, Caroline is right there. Yeah, so uh, we then uh, completed trainings in the hospitals that are also indicated there in the areas that we showed you. Um, yeah, so Carolyn. Yeah, so then that kind of leads us to the next component of what we're working on, on that, you know, difference of care, or the components of care that go to the trauma patients. So to take a step back about what that means um, is when you think about operative interventions for patients with injury, we think often about the bellwether procedures. And I think this is a common discussion within global health and within at least global surgery. And these are procedures that are considered to be critical procedures that any health system should be able to provide. And the three procedures selected are C-section, laparotomy, and open fracture treatment. And you can see really the last two, laparotomy and open fracture, relate to the care of the injured. But I think it's important when you think about these terms to think about what they're actually talking about the, that the surgeon is doing. 
So what is the person who is intervening, who's performing surgery actually doing? And so what does laparotomy mean? Laparotomy simply means to cut the flank. And that's what's shown here. It's making a single incision and entering the abdomen. But does that treat the injuries? I think, let, you know, as we would all presume, that does not. And so what does it actually mean to consider what is needed to be done to address the injured patient? And that's really when you talk about doing a trauma laparotomy. And this is when we talk about controlling bleeding, identifying injury, controlling contaminating, and doing the necessary reconstructions or repair of patients. And so as you can see, this is not necessarily a simple procedure that someone is performing, but requires a deep set of knowledge. And that's really why we wanted to set out to also ensure that there was you know, education around how to approach this in a standardized way. Um, and this has really led us to doing the operative trauma course, which is done with the surgical interns at Malago. So the operative trauma course is a course that, um, so the advanced trauma course, the Kampala advanced trauma course is the one that we uh, train the interns, five years medical school, one year for the internship. So the operative trauma course is a little bit more advanced. This is a course that we hand out to surgical residents. Uh, most of the times these residents are either in year two or year three. So in Uganda, you do the five years, then one year internship, then maybe two years of practice, then uh, three, four years of uh, surgical residency. So this is a training that we hand out to second year residents, second and third year. We do this course twice a year. And uh, um, this case includes uh, case conferences between UCSF residents and local residents discuss challenges um, also through chesa we've managed to uh, get faculty from here uh, in the picture you can see dr rachel she's a trauma surgeon and you can also see one of the residents this is dr allen so all these have been to uganda to go through this uh, to help us out with this uh, course um, so the course involves uh, didactics uh, basically um, you have someone um, talk about uh, uh, part of a uh, trauma or surgical procedure. And then there's hands-on training. Uh, these are cadavers, dissections. Uh, they do all kinds of maneuvers and um, the surgeons are there to help them out, show them what to do and what not to do. So as uh, part of our projects, we also created a, a website. It's called www. Kampalatrauma.org. So basically, we just choose everybody on average has a mobile phone. So we just use mobile phones to record uh, uh, surgical procedures being done, you know, like the airway, chest tube placement. And then it's open access, available to all health uh, workers in Uganda. So if you have a moment, you can look at our website. It's not fancy, but it does the work. So we've also created some protocols and sometimes we print them on posters and give them out to the hospitals where we go. They're also uploaded on our website. So, so trauma surgery fellowship development. So who is a trauma surgeon? A trauma surgeon is a, you know, a specialist uh, with a background of surgery who participates in resuscitation, operative management, as well as directing post-operative care of uh, trauma patients. So they also perform some, some non-physician tasks like uh, monitoring quality outcomes, advocating for injured patients, and critical care of uh, polytrauma patients. So, we, uh, so the concept of fellowships is relatively new in Uganda, but there is something else we call the College of Surgeons for East, Central, and Southern Africa. It includes um, about 14 countries. <coughs> So unfortunately, in the entire uh, region of Cosexa, in those 14 countries, there is no trauma or acute care uh, surgery fellowship. So we, we are trying to develop one in Uganda as the first in the Cosexa region. So other, you know, previous studies have shown that uh, presence of a specialist who is uh, qualified in managing trauma goes a long way in improving patients' outcomes when they are injured. So in the past, uh, we've done a needs assessment, we've rolled out a, a survey, and we've surveyed residents who would be um, people that would consider a, a, a career in trauma, and then uh, members of the Association of Surgeons of Uganda who would be the teachers on the course. And there is overwhelming support for trauma and acute care surgery. So the curriculum development is ongoing, and we have partners with the uh, local university, Makere, which is the major university in Uganda. 
together with Chesa and UCSF. So from the survey, 89% of specialists agree that there is a role for a surgeon who specializes in the management of injured patients in Uganda. And when we ask them about the perceived reason for lack of uh, trauma specialists in Uganda, the two major things were lack of a proper trauma system in Uganda and the other one was lack of a uh, training program in Uganda, such that even if someone was interested in um, a career in trauma, there would be no program to enroll in. So, um, most of them feel that a hybrid of local and international setting would be ideal because sometimes it's difficult to imagine. Like before, for example, if you're back in Africa, before coming here, it can be difficult to kind of imagine what it's like over here. So back in Uganda, we've not seen a proper, um, a proper trauma system, the way it runs, the way it functions. So it would be better for people to do kind of like a hybrid um, kind of training with some international teachers, local teachers, that kind of thing. Yeah, so the implications of this trauma fellowship survey are that trauma represents a staggering unmet surgical need in Uganda, and specialists and residents view a locally run trauma fellowship program as critical in addressing the burden of trauma. So specialists and residents provide actionable recommendations for curriculum development that we are trying to factor in their you know, comments and contributions in the development of the curriculum. So we also had some free response tests in the, in the survey, and some people felt that Uganda is overwhelmed with trauma, with an urgent need for better and emergency systems. Some felt that it's long overdue, the need is enormous, patient survival would increase exponentially, and there will be, um, and some specialists currently um, caring for trauma patients are not really interested in the entire trauma patient. Everyone usually focuses on their bit. Neurosurgery will come and take care of the head, cardiothoracy will come and take care of the chest. So there is definitely need for a person who can look at the trauma patient as a whole. Uh, so what you're looking at um, is showing you the existing work uh, on the trauma system. So we have, uh, when you look at the trauma system, you look at the pre-hospital, you look at emergency care, you look at surgical care, you look at in-hospital care. So there are so many different people doing all these kinds of things in Uganda. Um, for us, we do surgical care, we are surgeons. There are people doing emergency care. There are some that are doing pre-hospital care and uh, in-hospital care as well. But uh, there are so many organizations. Um, here we've just shown you just a few. Uh, on the Up here, this is Ministry of Health. This is Emergency Medical Services. They've um, established a training program. All this is focusing on the pre-hospital and the emergency care. So it's, it's the only thing that our sort of like government is focusing on, this pre-hospital and emergency care. And you have another group of people that went up to the northeast and set up a trauma registry. These were mainly looking at the burden of trauma, especially up that side, not in the whole of Uganda. Then to this corner, you have a group of people from the university. Uh, this university is the major university in Uganda. It's called Makere. They are doing research, they're from public health, focusing on injury prevention and awareness. So um, these are just a few, but this is meant to show you the scattered focus on the trauma system in Uganda. There's so many um, people focusing on their own things. There's no trauma, it's, it might be very difficult for you to imagine being here, but there's no trauma system in Uganda. So this brings us to something um, a, a central problem. There is no coordination of any kind of trauma programs and the lack of attention to the trauma system creation. So what did we then decide to do? We decided to establish something called the Trauma Surgical Foundation of Uganda. And our aim here was to bring all stakeholders for injury or trauma under one central organization with a single mission around creating a trauma system in Uganda. And then the second aim was to further our education mission on all front, uh, so that all frontline healthcare workers, not just the ones that we've mentioned, being the interns or the residents, but to focus on all these other people involved in trauma. And uh, 
help them understand how to care for the injured patients. Then the other aim was to create a transparent system where we can manage the trauma grants so that we can do more research, hence more interventions. And uh, all of this, we faced some challenges or we faced some challenges. For example, the ministry does not have any um, organizational focus on the trauma issue. So there's some focus like I've shown you, but the key role in trauma is mainly towards the surgeons and um, then there, there's no focus on that end. And then there are significant silos between all groups working on trauma. So basically no coordination. And then there's no infrastructure as well for obtaining or <coughs> managing grants focused on trauma. So this um, foundation, where are we right now? So we've set up the foundation. We've done all the groundwork. Uh, we are obtaining the license as well. And we are setting up collaborations. So we are currently um, reaching out to more organizations to set up collaborations and uh, further our agenda. And uh, this brings us to the end of our presentation. But all in all, it thanks a village. And um, this would not have been possible if it were not for Chesa. Uh, Professor Duruk, shout out to you, um, has brought all of us together. So there are so many people that have been involved. This is just a few of them. And uh, yeah, I think. That's it. Thank you. for questions. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for an amazing talk. Uh, it was really incredible and summarized like a lot of work over a long time and I'm so glad that Treasure and Martha are here spending time with us um, and all the work that um, Caroline has also been doing and Patty thank you also for all you do for Chessa. But we wanted to open it up for questions um, from the group about any of the work that's been presented or your own work in um, potential other areas, building systems and building organizations and trying to develop sustainable programs. So I'm really curious to hear from the group about any questions they might have or their experiences. This talk, what a display of extraordinary commitment uh, to a vision that uh, I know is hard to uh, precipitate out when you're talking to so many moving targets. I'm just really curious how you factored in the uh, lack of funding that is at the core of these types of services uh, and kind of how that made you stumble or stutter and what you did to overcome it. Because I've been confronted with this same moment in many settings and I've not been really successful in the surgical arena to get real traction. The question was about funding. So that, that has definitely been a challenge and it's usually a challenge in all areas which are low on uh, resources. Um, however, we we have been lucky for now. There's a young lady called Laura Case. Laura Case was from the UK and, and um, she had come to Uganda for you know student rotations back in 2004. And she was knocked down by a motorcycle, believe it or not, and she ended up dying. So her family set up um, sort of like a trust in her memory. And over the years, they've been uh, supporting a lot of the trauma work in Uganda. Um, there's no attempt to get into an, a national funding line. There it isn't available. Is that basically the way to look at it? It's not available. For this. Yeah. We are always trying, but so far 
we've not been successful. We've been to the ministry, we've been to the emergency uh, medicine department of the Ministry of Health. So we are not giving up, we keep going, but so far they have not shown um, a lot of support. <coughs> I think um, maybe just to hold on, did you want to say something, Caroline? Oh, well, I was going to say, I think that also does speak to why one of our big next steps, especially looking at the work we've done and where we want to go, is to set up a foundation. We can think one of the things that I know comes up a lot in global health is the question of the handling of funds and how you actually get the funds that you're trying to execute to work for your programs. Um, and one of our concerns was funds that are transited, for instance, through the ministry, get taken a little bit away <laughs> and, and funds that maybe get transited through the hospital or like basically not directly to the program often get leached a little bit I think all along the way and so one of the things that we know from at least experience on this side in terms of grants is that people really need to see like a history of good grant management to continue to give you funds and so I think that's part of why we wanted to have the foundation so we can have a standalone entity that's really just dedicated to these programs or we could receive funds and apply for grants really and be able to have that be a self-managing organization that we have control over the finances and really will be able to show good track history and one of the great things about Laura Case is that they have really supported this vision and their most recent which is likely to be their last but their most recent grant to us will really be at least the starting of trying to make this history to be able to show that we can manage grants to be able to kind of continue to push the, the ball forward. You know, Uganda has a number of peristatal organizations that the government has set up that is completely auditable, not in the government, not in the treasury, but stands right next to it, and they cut the check. So it's as close as you can get to it. But they've got two large ones that you could piggyback on. That would be great. Yeah. We could get some more advice maybe here from you all. Yes. Um, I think what, what you're bringing up has been a kind of long-standing challenge. Um, for us in the global surgery space is that you know trauma is definitely the biggest issue it's the biggest okay. public health issue it has the biggest burden and we know it's cost effective to treat it with these types of interventions like protecting the airway and you know uh, um, stopping hemorrhage and simple low-cost interventions there's just been a lack of interest in the donor community from USAID which puts not a single dollar into anything surgical to the Gates Foundation have outright said they are not funding surgical programs. They don't do treatment. Right, and the uh, ministries of health follow our funding patterns. Um, and so we uh, we continue to provide the evidence through the you know, 181 publications of the Chess Fellows and all the work over time to say, you know, it is cost effective, it is high burden, uh, but it has yet to sway a lot of major donors. Um, and so it's, a, it's been a kind of long-standing challenge is trying to get the international donor community to actually take this up. There's no NIH Institute for Surgery or NIH Institute for Trauma, so there's no pathway through there except for the occasional grant that comes through. Unfortunately, most of the NIH interventions are focused primarily on research and on hypothesis-based research and don't meet the greatest need, which is around workforce development and, and system development. So um, we, um, it's a continued kind of challenge for, I would say, the surgical community and the ICU community and the anesthesia yeah, community. Yeah. Um, and for those, I think, in the, that have lost many, you know, the families and the, the, uh, that have been affected by the loss of a family member or having a family member disabled, there hasn't been as effective a way of mobilizing those, that voice of what it means to live with a disability or to lose a loved one to an injury, um, as, as much as there has been for some other, you know, uh, critical movements in global health, like the HIV movement. So that's something that also we we've struggled with is actually mobilizing the kind of the voice of those affected by, by trauma. One area of some promising funding I think that we haven't tapped into but is, is there is, is disaster response because disasters get the attention of governments and international organizations and so some work in this space has been able to be funded through the, you know, disaster preparedness which basically is this work um, except we don't guys it really is disasters and sometimes we have to Millionize ourselves into yeah. something that will get dollars, but yeah. yeah. Dirk, it's a similar theme to Eric. I mean, I, by the way, an outstanding presentation and program. It's you guys are doing terrific work. Thank you. Um, 
And just to pick up on Eric's point, I'm frustrated because there are World Health Assembly resolutions that are signed, and there's one signed on this very issue. So it has no teeth then. All the member states sign, nothing mobilizes. I mean, I know we talk a lot about external donors, but there has to be also that political will internally. And I, I think maybe you've already answered this question, but really you don't see any engagement of political will internally. Even though those people that are in leadership probably have family members who've had trauma as well. You know, they yeah. have lived experiences within their own family. So what, what's missing here? I don't understand. Yeah, I think it's a mix of things. And I'm curious to hear, Treasurer and Martha, your take on this as well. But I think what we found over the years is sometimes when there are surgeon leaders in the ministry, which, which we actually currently have one right now who's in charge of health services, they've been definitely more open and interested. But a lot of times their funding strapped and their funding is tied to external, the you know, the external funding lines that are pretty much donor driven. So um, that has been a significant challenge. As far as the WHO, there still really is no surgeon at the WHO at the moment who's uh, leading trauma programs. There's the work, we have a great WHO eco collaborating center um, and surgery is part of that. So is ICU care, so is critical care. Um, but within the WHO there has, we've had a challenge having a surgeon lead. Um, and the WHO has been very important, I think, for political priority, but um, there often hasn't been any funding associated with these resolutions, as you know. Um, they've been politically important, but they have been attached and taken up by major funders. So it's an, it's an ongoing challenge. So they can, we can, they, the resolutions can be signed and the member states can agree, but unless there's dollars to follow, it's challenging to follow through. So we've depended on small institutional grants, um, philanthropy, uh, and then the incredibly hard work of people like Martha and Treasurer and all of the people that we've worked with over the years to kind of continue to keep this work going because it's an essential human right. I mean, at the end of the day, how can you be injured and not have access to having your leg casted or having hemorrhage controlled or having your airway dealt with if you're hit by a motorcycle, um, which is by far the most likely way that somebody will die in the world. Can I ask a one, one follow-up question? Can you expand on the last column you had on rehabilitation? I, I presume that there's work to be done in, in developing professional expertise in rehabilitation. Could you comment on where that's going? So, um, rehabilitation, of course, is very important following trauma because that's how you get function back. And um, in country, we have you know physiotherapy, a little bit of that. But uh, so far, we've, we've not um, had any component of rehabilitation, and it's it, it's it's the 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 gap is glaring. No one has really, really um, taken it under their wing, although it's a very, very important component of a trauma because that's how someone who had a very bad experience incorporates and back into society. Yeah. And, and I think that to one, the probably the biggest area of that is musculoskeletal care. We don't have orthopedic surgeons here who are within CHESA, but we have a, I got here at UCSF that has a lot of focus on this and. Our works, our colleagues in orthopedics, who it's an essential part of what they do is not just the fracture care, but the rehabilitation and that long term <laughs> investment that you need in those rehabilitative services are a big part of this. So I'm glad you asked that. Um, yeah, Eric. You know, you know. just make me think of uh, how frustrating this has been, and you just reminded me of it all. But um, have you thought about approaching this like through a National Academy of Medicine convening of a a proceeding that unpacks all of the obvious yeah. data, cost-effective right. arguments. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got your argument. What you have is an unwillingness of donors yes. to engage on this issue, and it's because they don't believe you should do this work in settings that you're in. They, they're arguing that they can't get it in their own developed setting, and they're saying, for that reason, I think you've got a very strong bias operating in who your funders are and what your funders are willing to fund, and you might approach it differently by trying to actually attack that belief system. I'd love so. to get your advice, Lauren, on yeah. how to bring those people together. Maybe you could help us, uh, but uh, I think there's definitely a role yeah. for that. That's helped move the needle for some things, for sure, um, to get some fun, more funding for surgical problems. So, um, I think, though, two things on that. I think one thing that's particular about trauma care as compared to many other types of care, like let's say you compare it to HIV care. 
HIV care has come such an amazingly long way that many patients can take one pill a day. But you have to think, I think, also about the transactions in care. So when you're an HIV patient, you can get pills donated to you that you obtain. When you're a trauma patient and you're coming to an emergency department, and let's say you need a chest tube place, which is a life-saving procedure if you have an injury in your chest, who is going to buy that chest tube? Where is that going to come from? As we all know, many issues with insurance schemes, I think one of the major challenges of, tra of trauma care that we are protected against in the United States. In the United States, we have a, a law called EMTALA. EMTALA is why, when a patient presents the emergency department, no one has to pay for the chest tube to go immediately in your chest. There is no structure for that in a low-income country. And so the transaction, the payment, has to happen after the fact, after the life-saving intervention is performed. And I think that that's like a major problem when you talk about funding. Like, you can fund some things through donors and some things through payment structures, but trauma falls outside of payment structures. You have to provide the care and obtain the payment at a later time. That's got to be the focus. Is, is, the, is the service need has got to be what you do first and worry about payment secondarily. That's a mind shift that isn't there. Yeah, and that's why I think it's we not often here in this forget, country either. But, but we have EMTALA. Yeah. Which, which requires that any emergency department that you come to provides life-saving care. And that's because of federal funding. Yeah. I mean, that's why they do that. that it, it's still a money-driven uh, yeah. behavior. That's, that's what I mean, though. I think there needs to be some discussion about the payments process. Yeah. But they also get that the surgeon involvement for, like, the healthcare workers, right? Healthcare workers aren't volunteers. They also need to be paid for those things. Yeah. Um, they're high. I don't know, Caroline, Caroline also has spent, she spent half her fellowship working on rural trauma yeah. uh, access in California and the US. I don't know if you want to mention a little bit of your take on that. Yeah, I guess like, I have a lot of background in health system, trauma system development in the United States, which and for me, my focus has primarily been on pediatric care. And there's some really great evidence around pediatric emergency department readiness and improvements in care. Um, but I will say also in the United States, in trauma care, we also have no we have no national trauma system, and all trauma systems are state-run, which I think is also something that we all often forget. Um, and they're legislated by the states. Every state has required, so every state except for Vermont has a state-mandated trauma system, which is often something that you don't see. But there is major issues also, even in this setting, with lack of funding to trauma. And if you look at when the last laws were passed, they were in something like 2015 to fund trauma. But we see major issues also in rural areas that actually are not truly really dissimilar, where, for instance, especially on the pediatric side, there can be a lack of material resources, right? So a child is not the same size as an adult. The tube you put into the chest of a child is a different size than the tube that you put into the chest of an adult. And figuring out how to adjust for those differences and how to improve the system as a whole. Um, this kind of gets also at the rehabilitation component, which I think actually has really interesting corollaries between the United States and abroad. So in the United States, there's also a set of specialists that we probably all don't often think about, but called physical medicine and rehabilitation physicians. And that's a whole physician group um, that often deal with rehabilitation. One of the problems we have in the United States when you look at disparities in pediatric care is that the reimbursement process, again, getting back to where the money <laughs> comes in, is actually different for adults versus children, to where that one doctor will actually get paid less to rehabilitate a child than they will get paid to rehabilitate an adult, which impacts the access to care in the United States for children who are suffering from injury. I think going to the orthopedic side in Uganda, to me the best evidence of the issues and the lack of attention to rehabilitation is really with this question of how you surgically address a patient. So in the United States, you can do a procedure called an operative fixation or a uh, a fix, internal fixation and uh, reduction of a fracture, which you do in the operating room, where you put a rod, for instance, in someone's femur so they can walk around. And the ability to walk around is critically important to rehabilitation, right? That's how you maintain your strength. In Uganda, to many of the hospitals that we've been to, I would say like half the ward of the rural hospitals we go to are patients who are sitting in bed or in bed, bed down for about six weeks, waiting on traction for their bone to naturally heal. Right? And so that's a big difference when you think about rehabilitation, is the process of healing. The process of healing requires infrastructure, requires that you have these sterilized rods, which is a lot of what the work of our orthopedic surgeons do. But I think that's where when you think about the whole patient, and I think this is where our perspective is kind of trying to remind people that we do more than just operate. 
Um, that the reason you do an operative intervention is for a future rehabilitation need, or the reason that you treat a patient in the emergency room and follow them through the ICU, and that we're not just proceduralists. And I think this is to one of our issues with the way we communicate is people tend to think of surgeons as just an operator, but we're not just proceduralists. We're really trying to see the whole patient. And I think that's one of the challenges in getting people to buy into our vision is that they just don't believe us, I think, often when we say that we're doing more than what we do. We like procedures too, but I yeah, we do. I mean, we don't have to operate, but you know, just saying that there's more that we do that's just not just operating. Well said. The other questions I know we're coming up to time. Yeah. Um, I have a question actually about disaster relief, and I guess I was wondering if in your program, is there like, is there like maybe implementation of like, like a triage system, for example, like if you have a lot of patients coming at once, or like the first response. I mean, I think you have to have an organized, the part of the way that just trauma care and disaster care overlap is that like the creation of programs like what Treasurer and Martha have talked about, which is creating a systematic, systematic way to approach a patient is creating a triage process. And I think one of the challenges is that if you don't have like a part of the, the justification for the integration and collaboration between trauma care and disaster relief is that if you don't have existing trauma like systems that function, when you get an influx of patients on top of that, it's just going to fall apart. It's already kind of falling apart. And that's really why I'd say I would say our care overlaps. I think one of the things that hasn't been receiving and received enough a lot of attention if you look at trauma literature related to disaster care, it's a lot of the disaster literature focuses on infections and like the post care and there's actually not a lot that's written about those who are injured and directly impacted by disasters, which is also some of the work that I have I've done. But I don't know if the treasure can speak to that too. Um, maybe I will say something. So here in states, um, when someone gets an accident, I think there's like a call that goes out and like a group of uh, medics come. These are guys that are trained. Uh, they have all the equipment in the ambulance. They have a, the driver can also do some stuff. And then the call goes out to the hospital, right? The hospital gets ready. They know what's coming in. And then by the time the patient gets to the hospital, um, everyone is aware. Uh, let's say the, 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 the trauma surgeon has been informed. There is actually even a trauma surgeon here. So basically, someone that is able to intervene surgically. Um, trauma is surgical. Whichever way you look at it, trauma is surgical. Um, if someone, whichever way you look at it, trauma is surgical. It can be the head, it can be the chest, it can be the abdomen. It's surgical. So when you have a trauma surgeon, they're able to intervene and save a life. Now, in Uganda, if you're walking by the road and you get knocked, people could literally bypass you. If uh, you're lucky, um, you get knocked, they call the police, someone, a bystander, informs the police. So the police is just going to come, not an ambulance, the police, um, they drive pickups, they, like the one that you saw. They'll put you in the pickup and think, okay, where is the nearest uh, government hospital? Why government? Because it's supposed to be free, but it's not free. So, then they ship you off, if you're in Kampala, to the National Referral, which is in Lago. So they've taken you to the hospital, but we are not aware that you're coming in. They haven't done anything for you while, while you go to the hospital. So they just put you in the emergency, and then whoever is in the emergency, let's say the nurse, if the doctor has gone out for lunch, has to call the doctor. Uh, so it depends. Uh, he might be too tired, or he might delay. In the meantime, maybe the nurse will put a line, maybe give you some fluids, maybe put some into, you know, depending on how they feel. And uh, yeah, then the, 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 the doctor will come in. Doctor could be an intern. The doctor could be a resident, or they could just be what we call medical officers. Or it could be, it's rare that it will be a surgeon. Then they will do what they have to do, maybe assess, maybe call another doctor for the head. They say, okay, this guy has uh, head trauma. Let's send him to the ward um, where they treat uh, head injuries. 
or let's send him to the ward, or let's call the, the person that is supposed to put the tube to put the tube. So you see, there is no trauma system. Um, there is no preparation. Um, so with what we are doing, we aim to teach the doctors how to triage. We aim to see how to create a champion for trauma. That's a trauma surgeon. Because if you have a trauma surgery fellowship, if you have a trauma surgeon, then people, then the trauma surgeon will advocate. They'll say, okay, no, we need to get a word for trauma patients. No, we need to get um, um, uh, maybe EMS to communicate with us before they come in. We need to get, so they will push the trauma system to change, but we don't have that yet. Then for the foundation, for the organization, it's meant to bring people together and say, look here, um, the infrastructure needs to change. Um, we need to provide funding for this. Trauma is killing our people. It's the leading cause of death in Uganda because our roads are not so good, our drivers are not so good. We have border borders everywhere. Border borders are motorcycles that carry people across the, 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 the city. And everyone does whatever they want. So, uh, yeah, so by doing this, this um, aims to improve um, all the things that we're all talking about. I know we're over time, but there are also very kind of specific, and that was really well said, mass casualty preparation modules and exercises that have built into some of these workshops over the years that are specifically geared towards mass casualty. I know it's way over time, so thanks everybody. Thanks. To the idea. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.